Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. North America and all the ships at sea. Let's go to press. Flash, Boston. The final figures are now in on the spectacular Brinks robbery. Over $2 million taken by gunmen in a commando-style <laughs> raid, making it the crime of the century. My sources in the FBI report evidence indicating an inside job with possible links to organized crime and communist subversives. This week marks the 70th anniversary, for its time, the largest robbery in U.S. history. On the evening of January 17, 1950, at around 6.55 p.m., a group of seven men wearing navy pea coats, chauffeurs' caps, and rubber Halloween masks entered the Brinks headquarters at 165 Prince Street in Boston's historic North End. While inside, they gagged and tied up workers and proceeded to rob nearly $2 million in cash, securities, and checks, which in today's money would be around $29 million. What happened in the, in the aftermath of that robbery is still talked about to this day and continues to fascinate the public. On today's show, we'll dig deep into what led up to the crime of the century, the infamous Brinks heist. All right, my guest this afternoon, Stephanie Shoro, was a former writer and editor for the Boston Herald. She also freelanced for the Boston Globe in the Associated Press. She has authored eight nonfiction books, including Inside the Combat Zone, the stripped-down story of Boston's most notorious neighborhood, Drinking Boston, a history of, of the city and its spirits, while co-authoring the Boston Mob Guide, Hitmen, hoodlums and hangouts to name a few today we'll be discussing her, her book the crime of the century how the brinks robbers stole millions in the hearts of boston i'm thrilled to have her on the show this afternoon stephanie shoro thank you so much stephanie for joining me this afternoon oh thank you for inviting me uh first of all stephanie i mean you know like i said in during obviously the intro you've written so many books about the history of boston crime i mean what led you to the to write a book about the brinks job it was an opening at uh, the jur what was then called Jury's Hotel uh, in downtown, which opened up in the former uh, police headquarters on Berkeley Street. Mm -hmm. uh, it was taken over and turned into this fancy schmancy hotel. But at the time, they tried to uh, give uh, homage to its history as the Boston Police Headquarters. And they had a little exhibit about the Brinks robbery in the former hotel and i've been casting around for some other uh topics to write about and um margaret um sorry not margaret sorry, uh i the woman who was the archivist for the boston police department was there and she put up this exhibit and i kind of vaguely heard about the brinks everyone hmm. kind of vaguely heard about it but i was able to see some real uh, interesting information and photos and I said that would make a good book mm. and then the archivist said oh yeah we got we got um like 14 boxes of material on the robbery back at uh, police headquarters in the wow. evidence area wow. and I said okay that's a book and um because a lot of this that material had not been gone through because there had been a number of books about the brinks i Correct. mean that was the I first mean, one yeah no yeah. ben no ben wrote one years ago right he wrote one um that became the movie uh the brinks job and there were a number of other books uh on on that crime but no one had done it recently and so I thought, oh, this would be great to, to go there and look through that material. Because there's one thing about writing history. In fact, someone just asked me about this uh, concerning the Brinks was, is anything new been discovered about that? And I find with my books on history, something new is always coming up. History's never gone. History's never dead. There's always things coming up about um, even things that seem way, way past. And so when I went into this book, I, I soon realized there would be new information to include on the Brinks robbery. Uh, so I wasn't just rewriting what right. had been written before. 
So, so Stephanie, I mean, for, for obviously it was uh, yesterday it, made, it marked the 70th anniversary on Friday. It was the 70th, mm-hmm. 70th anniversary um, of the Brinks heist. Uh, very, I mean, a lot of generations may not, obviously the newer generations may not know it because a lot of people I talk to in my circles are like, oh, it sounds familiar. But yeah. Um, yeah. M- maybe you can touch briefly on some of the characters that were involved in the, the crime of the century for its time. Well, they, it was called the crime of the century. And basically what, um, what people woke up to or heard about that evening was that um, seven or nine, they weren't even sure at first, uh, mass men had broken into the headquarters of the Brinks uh, on the in, on the north uh, north end of Boston. Now, the, the, the thing about the Brinks, you have to understand the Brinks was this well-known armored truck um, company that moved, moved money all through the city. And it, at that time, Boston was a cash society. So when you got paid, your paycheck, it was in cash. Right. So the idea that the Brinks, which was considered the premier place to stash your money or move it, was broken into, first of that was really amazing. But the idea was that these mass men got into the Brinks headquarters and in the matter of 15 to 20 minutes or less – managed to make out with millions of dollars and they weren't sure about it at first and the money that was taken was just absolutely astonishing to people at that time i think we're a little jaded today but at the time the idea that someone could get out get away with a million dollars in cash was just that was just almost unheard of and the other thing about the robbery is that it happened so a so quickly and b the guys got away cold there were mm. no arrests that right. evening no arrests in the uh, in the the weeks that followed, the guards there were guards who were held up during the robberies. It wasn't you know it wasn't like they went in with nobody there, but um, no one was hurt. Right. Nobody was hurt. That that was a that's a key element of this. They got in, got out. No one was hurt. No one was roughed up. Clean getaway. Um, why why do we uh, like Ocean's Eleven's movies? We keep it's because the idea is that you you do this heist, you get away with it, no one's hurt. It's it's cl- it's quick, it's slick, boom, you're gone. Talk, talk a little bit about Stephanie, if you can, the, the, the so called mastermind Tony Pino. How, how did he come? To, I mean, how did he come to the the realization that let me rob this place? Okay, well, Tony Pino was um, he actually was born in Italy and uh, came here as uh, just uh, as an infant, but he was always in danger of being deported because he actually wasn't an American citizen not at the time, and he got into a life of crime very early. He was a uh, juvenile delinquent, for lack of a better better word. So he was always um, paying his lawyers, and he ran out of money, so he'd have to commit another crime <laughs> to pay more <laughs> lawyers. Uh, and he was, by all accounts, a very kind of a strange fellow. He was a jovial man. He could tell stories that would just keep you riveted, make you laugh. He had a kind of a sinister side to him. He's very overweight, um, but he was also a master s- disguise. He grew up in South Boston, very near a childhood f- friend named who would be nicknamed Specky, Specky O'Keefe. Mm-hmm. But um, he um, was a master Pete man. In other words, Pete, the Pete guy was someone who could break into a safe. And he was the one who got the idea of robbing the Brinks Brinks headquarters because he followed the Brinks trucks to the headquarters. And he realized all that money was in the Brinks uh, building there in the uh, on the north end. Uh, and he managed to, according to his story, again, we don't know for certain, but his story was he managed to break into the Brinks and found out that when the um, – Guards left for the day. They just left. The, the place was deserted. The place where the money was stored, which was in a huge vault in one corner of the building, was left empty. And so he managed to uh, get into the building to kind of stalk these people. He also watched from a nearby mm. hill. And I've, I've walked around that area, and you can still see right into the windows wow. of the brinks. are huge windows, and he could get on a building – and just watch and watch what's going on. So the story goes that he watched the Brinks uh, building for months and months until he knew the exact um, routine of the guards and the other people who counted the money uh, and moved the money. And so then he decided he was going to rob it. He, he gathered his um, crew of fellow robbers, which included his uh, brother-in-law, uh, Vinnie Costa, his childhood friends, friend Spex O'Keefe, 
um, Barney Bainfield, who was uh, going to be the getaway driver, uh, another friend of his, Sandy Richardson. These are all kind of minor thieves that that just um, had records. They they knew each other from prison. Um, there was a, a total of nine men in all, including a guy named uh, Stanley Gashora, who was the youngest person, uh, youngest member of the gang, uh, very much beloved by everybody, um, considered a stand-up guy. That's what they call him, stand-up guy. And then also he gathered this guy named um, Adolf um, Jazz, was his nickname, Maffey, Jazz Maffey, who was the respectable member of the crew. He was uh, a bookie, a respectable <laughs> calling in those days. And he was very tall, very handsome, uh, and he was, but he was brought in to help uh, commit this crime. Uh, a Will, uh, a, um, William McGinnis, a barkeeper, was brought in to launder the money because one of the issues with um, taking out so much money is that you'd have to somehow launder it in some way that doesn't right. raise suspicion. Clean it. Also, clean it out. You also have to be very careful about other robbers because if they find out you've committed a robbery, Robbers will come after you, and you have, you can't go to the police about that. So that was a that was a big big issue for them. Did he break in and get some lock with the locks? Well, here's here's the thing that was most mysterious, kind of the most interesting aspect of this. According to what uh, Pino said, and as far as we can tell, this this was brought out at trial that he br- first broke into the um, brinks just to look around, but then very cleverly. He managed to take out the lock cylinders in all the doors in the drink, cause in the Brinks headquarters that led up to the counting room when they counted the money. So, in other words, they had um, uh, he would go in, pull the lock cylinder out of a door, put in a dummy cylinder, rush to a key shop um, some distance away, get a key made for the cylinder, rush back and surreptitiously put the entire lock cylinder back into the door. And he did this for a series of doors, the doors between the outside, which was on Prince Street, and the doors leading up into the counting room. So they could go in kind of the back way with their own keys to the final spot where the money was being counted. Only there did they have to pull out their guns and tell the guards to open a door. They had keys to all that. Wow. And that was because Tony Pino was so smart in his ability to um, go in, take out these whole cylinders, get a key made, Incredible. and then go back in. Did he abo- Did they abort it six times? That's a story that basically they were getting ready to go and something would happen. In fact, the, the story goes that they actually, the robbers would go into the brinks after everyone left just to hang out. So it wasn't just Pino going there, but Spex describes being in there, going in and, and looking around um, and seeing what was there. In fact, they even discussed blowing up the safe wow. when people had left. And they actually, according to what they said, they stole the plans for the safe Um discovered that it wasn't uh, viable and then broke back in and put the plans back <laughs> in the um, in the headquarters Amazing. of the uh, it was it the um, no fear these the, guys the had alarm no, code. these guys had no fear not at this point no they were really very they were cautious remember the thing is i think they thought of this as us as a robbery but that, none of them i think expected the kind of no, notoriety it brought i mean i think they were expecting it was going to be a big robbery but i think when they were planning his house they were planning the 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 crime of the century. They were planning a big robbery. Right. Did, did, and I think they were astonished at how much publicity it got. Did they have any idea? I mean, obviously, we're talking Brinks, a lot of money. Did they have any idea how much was in there at the time? Yes, they did. They had a lot of idea. In fact, Tony, according to his own accounts, was disappointed by the hall. Wow. Because he said there was there at other times there was more money in there. Also, there was a box that contained the payroll for the General Electric plant that was in the area. And they couldn't get that box open. And they couldn't get that box open. And so they had to leave it behind. And in in other words, they felt that they didn't get as much out as they could go. So, so Stephanie, so they proceed, in, they get into the, inside the building with the keys they had, okay? Now, these guys are dressed in, in you know, they have, you, maybe you could describe what they were yeah, wearing. They, 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 this was another thing that they did, which was, which was actual genius. They were all dressed exactly alike. They mm. wore chauffeurs, caps, 
They wore navy pea coats, and they wore masks that covered their entire head. I swear so the mask. I mask swear the mask. One of the masks looks like Tony Curtis when I see it real quick. <laughs> yeah, they, they do. They do. They were. They were. They're. they're you know. They They were eerily human. They were actually Captain Marvel masks, but that's what gave it the kind of a creepy creepy appearance and the fact that they were so much alike it took a while for them to figure out how many people actually came in so uh and tony pino by the way did not go up into right. the brinks because in the, stayed, in the movie peter falk played tony pino he went in right he okay. went in he went in but in the actual crime he was too heavy yeah uh-huh. and he would have been recognized so he stayed down by the prince street door so the other people actually went in, up into the into the brinks headquarters um Barney Bainfield stayed outside because he was driving the getaway car, and Vinnie Costa acted as a lookout on a roof nearby. Uh, Joe McGinnis was not, I think I said William McGinnis, it's actually Joe McGinnis was the barkeep. He was not anywhere near the hmm. the, um, the robbery that night. Again, these are in the movie, these characters were all there at the time of the robbery. But that wasn't actually the case. That's why there's there's some discrepancies between the movie and what you see in the movie and what you see right. what happened re- in reality. Uh, A few things were real in in the movie. They get interrupted by someone buzz hitting a buzzer and trying to get in the um, where they were counting the where they were pulling out the money, and they were terrified by that. But they just waited, and the guy went away, yeah. and that actually did happen. Mm, interesting. Um, it, these guys wore special shoes or something on those. And they shoes. were they wore soft soled shoes and they wore gloves, uh, and so they did not leave any foot fingerprints, and they could walk softly. So they were b- I mean, very. Do we know the type of weather it was that night? Was it raining? Was it snowing? It was not raining. It was not snowing. I. It was cold. But it was a very cold evening, but there was no precipitation. Uh, that evening. So in order, obviously, there's a big bu- a bu- bunch of guys to get, to, in order for them to transport themselves to the, the Brinks itself, I mean, where did they get that vehicle and what was the vehicle? Well, they had uh, they had a, um, a car that they had converted into, I think it was a Ford truck, uh, that they had converted into something that would carry all the money because it, that took up a lot of space. So they had stolen this car, refitted it to carry money. And that was used to transport um, the loot. There was another car that was um, driven by Vinnie Costa because he served as a lookout. And I believe that was stolen as well. So there were basically two vehicles that were used for this. Mm. The the Vinnie Costa one and then the specially outfitted truck that was used to transport to money. This was the truck that was found in um, a dump in Stoughton. And was linked to the robbery. Mm. That is one of the things that took focus the suspicion on Gashora and Spex O'Keefe because they lived in Stoughton. Right. So the truck so, itself, that when when they got it to the whatever the junkyard, wherever yard it was, they mm-hmm. they beat the hell out of it. Yeah, they took it apart. They took it apart and they put it in an area that was scheduled to be uh, covered up. But somebody found it. Did they found put- all the pieces. See, they brought everything they needed, including rope and tape. So the only thing that was left at the scene there there were three main items. One was the tape that they used to tape up the guards. They also found the rope that they had brought and used to tie up the guards, and they found one chauffeur's hat. Hmm. And that was um, Speck's hat that had fallen off during the robbery. It was an accident. However, what happened is that it became this um, point of much speculation. Um, as part of my research, I went through a lot of the letters that were sent to the police department saying it, sending in tips and other things. And a lot of people had theories about this robbery and about why one chauffeur's hat was left at the scene. And um, this was uh, – it was funny because there was just so much speculation about it. But as it turned out, it was it was an accident. Hmm. The FBI, incidentally, still has that hat. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, got to, I got to go to FBI headquarters and oh, I have wow. a picture of myself holding the hat, <laughs> oh, oh, <interesting. laughs> which was wow. – I really, I really like doing that, yeah. 
Okay, Stephanie, so these guys clear out. They get in the trucks and whatever, the vehicles, and they leave. So who calls the police, and how do they get them tied? Okay, so what? So um, let me say something about the way they left. Okay. They left and dropped off the, the robbers at different places to establish alibis. For example, Tony Pino was dropped off at Joe McGinnis' bar, where he asked uh, a, a police officer who was there at the time. He asked Joe McGinnis, hey, what time is this? Is Joe McGinnis backed the time up so that it seemed like he was there earlier than what he was. Another robber um, was dropped off and got himself arrested, spent the night in jail so he could um, create right, a right. robbery for that. Sandy Richardson went home, fell asleep on his uh uh, in the living room, and his son later testified he was there all night, even though he wasn't. Now, the guards who were tied up, they, they were tied up and their glasses were taken. Um, so they couldn't really see what was going on, and they were tied up. But one of them, after the robbers all left, managed to get free, and he hit, a, he hit an alarm that brought in the police department, who came racing to the scene, as did a number of reporters, and the FBI soon showed up. So there was there was a huge... Uh, convergence of law enforcement people uh, within geez, half an hour to mm. definitely an hour after the robbery. And reporters the, actually got up into the Brinks headquarters as well. The, the, what time was it? The, the robbery was around 7 o'clock, 6.30, beating that in that time zone? About 7, 7.15, okay. yes. So they would be there about, I would say, before 8 o'clock. The place was buzzing with law enforcement people. Because I remember a long, long time ago, a, a dear friend of mine, his dad was working in Boston when that happened that night. And oh, I, really? I, and I'm like a history freak. You know, mm-hmm. I, I've always been fascinated by the Brinks. And, the, and I asked him, I says, oh, my goodness, you know, how was it? He goes, oh, they had the bridge closed off. Everything was closed. You couldn't get out of the north end. Mm-hmm. Yes, they, they basically closed everything off to make sure that they wanted to catch something because they knew there had to be a fairly large vehicle to take away all that money. Now, here's an interesting tidbit. They drove that truck um, uh, some distance away into the Mission Hill area where they unloaded the um, money into the home of Jazz, Jazz Maffey's parents. He might have been living there, but it was Jazz Maffey's parents at a place in Mission Hill, and they unloaded the, the money there. I actually drove that route when I was doing my research. We, I drove the distance from the Brinks in the north end to that spot, and I got there pretty quickly, even though, um, you know, today everything is different. Right. And, in fact, probably I couldn't do that now because the traffic in Boston has oh, got way horrible. worse, way worse. But I got, I think it was like 15 minutes or so. I think it's in the book. But I really got there very quickly. And I said, wow, they they could really haul butt, if you right. will, around the city at that time. So they did that. So they got out of the, the, the area pretty quickly. Um, they had a garage where I think they st- uh, that they used as kind of a stashing point. They probably stashed a truck there. And Joe McGinnis was in charge of getting rid of the truck, getting rid of all the evidence of all the, the cars and the money, he was in charge of getting rid of the money that was marked that they knew that ha- they had they knew had the serial numbers of the bills, and he was supposed to get rid of that as well. So, so the police show up, FBI shows up. The FBI shows up because was it security's there? It's federal. How how did we- um. I think they were called in because it was a big crime, and they just were believed. They, I think, anything of that size, I think they'd have a few agents show up, and then they call it in because okay. you know that kind of amount of money. They soon realized it was a huge amount of money, so I think that there was a feeling that um, they would get involved. Hoover was. I don't know if he was informed that night, but he took a very personal interest right, I was in this case. Right. Yeah, he was very interested in the Brinks case. Hmm, interesting. Something, I'm not sure he ever visited. I think he visited Boston maybe once or twice. Um, it's a little unclear about that, but he, he definitely believed it uh, believed it to be something the FBI should really pay attention well, to. Well, I Yeah, go ahead. Because this is, you know, we're talking 1950. They're thinking communists. Exactly. Like, I think at first there was this um, thought that it could be part of, I think at first there was this thought that it could be part of the Cold War, the right. standoff between, and it could have been done by agents, uh, Russian agents. A lot of people believe that. Um, and J. Edgar Hoover apparently believed it for a while, although it's a little unclear he believed it much um, after a couple months that I think they started to really zero in on who the robbers wa- were. They had a pretty good idea about that, but they couldn't figure out how they pulled it off. Right. And they... And they never would have figured it out until uh, Specs um, 
Right. Well, yeah, we're going to turn uh, turn to uh, evidence. Uh, okay. You know, we're talking 1950. Not, you know, the news back then obviously was delivered through radios, and not too many people had a lot of television sets. Uh, so, no. where the mouth w- was, you know, ruled in 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 that time period, where the mouth was king, and that's mm-hmm. how. So, how did it spread to the Boston's, you know, criminal underworld? What was the buzz going on with them? I mean, shakedowns and. Well, I, all I can say is to quote you something that was in one of the. Um, a line from the evidence from a detective in the archives. He said that he talked to someone who was known to be in a criminal element, and the guy said, "said No, I have no idea who pulled this off, but if I did, I'd be after that loot myself." Mm. So there was, there was. I think criminals were very actively looking for who had committed this crime, as well as um, the police did. And like I said, the police kind of zeroed in on people like Spex O'Keefe and Gashora very quickly. Those two basically, by the way, they robbed a hotel the night before the Brinks. Pino was going to kill them. Wow. So why would you do that? But they, I mean, these guys were just, crazy. I don't know if they're fearless or crazy. Yeah, they pulled off, <laughs> they knew they were going to do hit the Brinks, but then they, they pulled off a a um, robbery uh, at a hotel the night before, and Pino was furious about it. Stephanie, to get, to get a view of a, the point of view from a reporter, you spoke with the now deceased uh, reporter Ed Corsetti of the exactly. e- Evening American. I mean, what did he tell mm-hmm. you inside that what was going on? Well, he 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 was great. Uh, Ed told me about he got the word through they they monitor the police radio so he got the word and was told to go out to the bank's headquarters and he knew exactly where it was because the um, some of the newspapers parked their trucks there as well so he got there he got into the uh, vault room uh, because they didn't really cord enough so he got in and he said he was amazed by what he saw he said the 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 money on the floor was like a foot thick. Wow. And he looked at the floor and he said, oh, my God, if those guys left that much here, I wonder how much did they get away with? So and in his account has been corroborated by some other people who were there that there was a lot of money lying on the floor of the uh, the Brinks. In fact, uh, John Landers, who um, the photographer at the um, Herald, who just who passed away a few months ago, um, but he told me his father, who was also a photographer for the. One of the papers was there, and he told him that he wished he had gum on the bottom of the shoe because he would have <laughs> walked out with a lot of money. Oh, but anyway, God. Ed got and he got there, and he got as much information as he could, and he got back to the newsroom, and it was all hands on the story for the next two to three weeks. I think he described an editor getting on a desk in the newsroom and saying, okay, guys, I want everything you got on this robbery. I don't care if it's true or not. We want everything <laughs> right. we can get. And maybe say it just like that, but he basically right. said, get everything you can get in, in, on this robbery. So they take a little bit of evidence and they'd run with it like a mysterious blonde who was probably involved mm. or um, right. that it could be an inside job. So they were they were um, taking little bits of things and blowing it up. Um, I, I don't think they were making it up exactly, but they might – but stretching a police it a officer, bit, you know, yeah, stretching was, it, right, right, stretching it, stretching right. it, maybe more than a little bit too. But, but they because they were just told we need something every day. We need a lot of coverage every single day. Right. So they were just again popping news, out stories. You know, newspaper again. Newspapers back then were king. Newspapers were king. Yeah, and um, yeah, you know, little guy in the corner, extra, extra. You know, Brinks robbery. You know, and it was a big exactly. deal. Exactly, big deal. It was a huge deal. It was a huge deal all uh, over the country, all over the country. So, Stephanie, on February fifth, there were some guns found. Right. There was a guns found. Um, one was found in near a trash bag, I think it's Somerville. And one was found um, near the um, edge of the uh, Mystic River. So they p- was pulled out of the muck. So basically, these were the guards guns. So they linked them to the guards. And obviously, someone had been trying to get rid of them, but didn't do a very good job with it. So that was one p- a piece of evidence that they found. Uh, that uh, these guns were the guns that were taken away. When they tied up the guards, they took away their guns, they took away their glasses, they made them lie down, and they taped their mouths shut so they couldn't um, scream or make noise. Um, and then these were guns were found. Now, they, they um, and they were linked to the crime. And then a little while later, they found uh, cut up pieces of a, of a truck in a Stoughton dump. And they concluded this was probably the getaway car mm. that was used to carry the money. 
Now, be so telling- those were two big pieces of evidence that they found. Bex was, like you said, he's in jail right now, and his lawyers are eating up whatever money he has. So he's exactly in the movie. The um, the Spex O'Keefe character said he needed money for his his, his sister's cancer uh, operations or something. I don't believe that's true. He, right. he basically he just was needs money just for his own living and for his lawyers. In fact, he when he got out of jail, he went back to Boston to retrieve his his share of the loot. And what happened? And, that's, that? and what happened? Well, he went to Jazz Maffey to say, "Where's my loot?" And Jazz Maffey admitted that he spent it all. Wow. And Jazz and he said, "Well, give me your share, some of your share." And Jazz said, "I spent that too." <laughs> so. It's it was so, a peculiar situation where they probably Jazz Maffey had gambled it all away. That's what I'm saying. These guys really didn't enjoy that money. They just spent right. it. And so so Specs Specs believed himself to be a reasonable man. He considered killing Jazz, but he thought that wouldn't be so good. So he said, Well, let me just get the guys together and they can each give me some of their money. I kept my mouth shut. I haven't talked. Give me some money and let me go let me know. Uh, then I'll go on my way. Well the other guys didn't Think of him, think of that it was their fault that Spex had got himself in jail, so they wouldn't give him any money. Uh, Spex had a confrontation with a robber named uh, Henry Baker um, over this, and they actually pulled guns on each other. But again, there was nothing, no money was changed hands. But now the other members of, and now this is where the robbery takes a very dark turn, because one of Spex's friends disappears and there are other murders that are happening that may or may not be connected with the robbery. But the robbers apparently decided they had to get rid of Specs. So they brought in a, a um, hitman named Trigger Burke, who was well known um, in crime annuals. And he was brought into Boston to take out Specs. And one evening, when Specs was uh, walking home in Dorchester, he was going to his house in Dorchester. Um, somebody opened up machine gun fire at Specs, who miraculously managed to escape with his life. Um, I think he had a bullet hit his watch, but he ran off, leaving a trail of blood. Um, and but he escaped, and Trigger Burke was arrested. And they, I think he, he I think I don't know if he confessed. He's a, he was a pretty wacky guy. He talked about himself in the third person. And said things like, "Oh, Burke is Elmer Burke is next. Elmer Burke is not going to hurt anyone." He talked, so he was kind of not exactly yeah. all there. But and here's the bizarre thing: Burke was being held in the uh, Charles Street Jail. He escaped. Wow. He managed to escape with the help of somebody, likely Tony Pino, um, probably on orders from the New York people. Said, "You know, we get him out of there because, you know, he can." He can spill the beans and a lot of things. So he managed to get out of the Charles Street Jail. So he took off. Now, but what this did was that Specs now, O'Keefe was now a cognizant that these guys were not his friends. So he's picked up um, on some outstanding warrants. He was held in Springfield. And this is when the police and the FBI all went to work on him. Um, a guy named Frank Wilson, who was one of the few African Americans in the Boston police force, he played a major role in this. And then another FBI agent, another couple of FBI agents played a major role in working on specs and saying, come on, you don't know these guys anything. Um, why aren't you telling us what happened? It's going to go really bad for you. They're going to try to kill you again. Why are you holding out? And so finally, Specs agreed to tell them the whole story of the Brinks. Hmm. And when he finished telling them, that's when the rest of the robbers were arrested. Yeah. And it was just before the statute right. of limitations. How many, uh, how many days or how many weeks was it before the statute? It was like ran ten out? days. I believe wow. it was about ten days. A little. It was a little. It's a little unclear because there were some arrested. They they weren't arrested all at once. They were arrested at different stages. But let's say it was about ten days before the state statute of limitations run, would run out on the crime. So they all got, did they all get tried separate? Obviously, a lot of them. Separate? No, they all got tried together. Oh, they did. They got tried oh, wow. together. Yeah, they're all tried together. They had um, some very prominent uh, lawyers. For, the, for their defense, and they were convinced they were going to get off. Um, one of their lawyers, interesting enough, was uh, the father of Lawrence O'Donnell. Lawrence O'Donnell was on MSNBC. Oh, yes, I know. The was, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. His, his father was one of the lawyers for the defense on the Brinks. Mm. So, um, and they had another uh, gentleman, um, uh, Smith, I 
blanking on his first name, but he was an extraordinarily skilled and prominent defense attorney who did a lot of these um, kind of crime-related uh, defenses. And I think the guys thought they were really going to get away. First of all, it was several years later. There wasn't a lot of circumstantial evidence. Uh, and really what they had was their word against Specs. Um, uh, but a couple of things happened. One, right before the trial was to begin, they finally found some of the money from the Brinks robbery. Um, a, a guy named Jordan Perry tried to pass um, some bill. He was in um, Baltimore, I believe, and he was paid for something with some very old bills that were very dirty. And the guy who took them were suspicious, contact police, and this this money was traced. Well, they, they arrested Jordan. He brought him to more money, which he said he found in an abandoned building, which is kind of his story. But um, they also um, raided the headquarters of a place of a construction company on Tremont Street, and they picked up uh, a couple wise guys named Fats Busilli and Wimpy Bennett. Wimpy Bennett. And Wimpy Bennett. That was his nickname, Wimpy Bennett. The Bennett brothers, by the way, were connected to um, the yep. Steve the Rifleman Flemmy. Right, later I know on. that name. That yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, they found money and they were able to link it to the to the Brinks robbery. It looked like it had been buried. It was dirty. And, you know, it was some of that money that probably Joe McGinnis was supposed to get rid of. But he just buried it and then brought it out probably when they were running out of money. And tried to pass it, but that was about fifty thousand dollars, fifty five thousand dollars. But that's the only money that wow. was ever linked to the Brinks robbery. But they were able to use it for the trial. So the trial had the um, um, uh, this money. They had the the uh, broken up pieces of the truck. They had the tape and the uh, rope that was used, and they had the chauffeur's cat cap, which Specs actually put on in court to show him it was his hat that had fallen off. Did they have any, Still, any, any of the Brinks guards as witnesses? Oh, yeah. And the, and the guards all testified. Okay. Yeah, I believe they testified as well. Um, but And then the robbers didn't take the stand in their own defense, but um, Richardson's son testified that his father was home. And um, I interviewed that son later on. And it, you know he loved his father dearly, even though his father was a criminal. But he started crying when he, he described how he he basically lied for his father. He didn't really know he was lying, but it was it was just it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking for him. Anyway, so they might have still gotten off, except that Specs gave a spectacular testimony. He could not be shaken. He could be, not be mm. moved. He really gave very straight. Uh, account of the robbery described how the robbers planned it out described how pino went and got his um the locks made they brought in the locksmith who testified making the keys for pino wow oh, um <laughs> yeah yeah they brought the, the guy in t to talk about that um and spex was on the stand for a number of days and just um really was an excellent witness for the prosecution and what did they all receive for for uh sentences okay. okay they um got life sentences um get mcginnis got nine life sentences wow um and they were and, and they were very high i mean lawrence o'donnell said he was surprised at how high the sentences were because you know get down to it it wasn't murder it was just a robber it was a big robber yeah, nobody it was got hurt, basic right. robber nobody got hurt but i think it was because the guys refused to confess on it it's probably, um, because, and it's probably the, because maybe the media and maybe Hoover was embarrassed a right. little bit, maybe. Well, and the judge, interesting enough, the judge, Felix Forte, who actually sentenced them, was Italian and who was very much um, hmm. right. gave lectures about there's no such thing as a mafia because he considered a slur on Italians. So I think he was trying to send a signal to the, um, to the, to the gang, some of whom were Italian, some of whom were um, Irish, and one of whom was Jewish, and then Gashor was Polish. So it was a kind of this United Nations of crime. <laughs> so he basically basically threw the book at them. And so they were sentenced to um, years in the Walpole State Prison. They also had to serve some terms on its Deer Island Prison afterwards. So off they all they all they all now Gashor and Bainfield died before the trial, and Specs was given immunity for his testimony. Hmm. So the other guys went to jail uh, for varying terms. Like I said, they all got life terms, and they got out at various times. 
Tony Pino was the last guy to get out, and I believe he got out in the 1976 or 77. Um, so he was the last guy to get out. Um, and McGinnis and Baker died in jail. Mm. Wow. And um, the others, uh, I think Gagan and Flaherty were um, sick when they got out. Flaherty was pretty sick when they got out. After they got out, they did. They were interviewed by uh, Noel Bean. Okay, Stephanie, uh, after the trial, what, what happened to Spex O'Keefe? Spex O'Keefe kind of had a, a sad history after the trial. I mean, he was he was racked with guilt with becoming a stool purse pigeon. Um, as one of the FBI agents told me, he said it went against every grain in his body. Every bit of feeling that he had was to uh, not to turn evidence, but he did. So he didn't. One thing he did not get out until 1960. It took a while for the wheels of justice. So he got out in 1960. Now the FBI was was uh, put him in sort of a witness protection program and they did not desert him i mean they really treated him quite well basically they moved him out to california helped him find a job settled him in he took a different name um he actually worked as a chauffeur for um ted for um Cary Grant for a while. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, he was a chauffeur for Cary Grant. At least that's the story. But <laughs> but um he he so he he Settle, he could never really settle down. He would. Uh, he. I looked at his FBI file. He got in trouble for drinking a few times, and he kept coming back to New England. It wasn't safe for him, but he came back anyway. Mm. And he'd run into people like he. He ran into the defense attorney, uh, and and uh, he says, "Spex, what?" And the defense attorney said, "What are you doing here?" He wants to down. And he said, "Well, I just thought I'd check things out." And he actually went back to the family of Stanley Gashora to talk to them because I, I talked to some members of the family and he came by to say um, he's really sorry about Gus's death and he really missed him. And it was a very pleasant conversation. And they even asked him, where did they, where did he, did he think that um, Gus put his money? And he described a place near the house where he said Gus used to hide his loot and they went and looked there, but didn't find anything. Um, I looked there too, by the way. I didn't find anything. Any you sure? Either. But, you sure? Yeah, I, I went. Out there. I walked to the thing. I had nothing. There. But but um, he so he kept trying to come back to New England. And he finally gave up, and he went back to California, um, and he died in the nineteen seventy. Hmm. Six or so he died. I mean, Tony Pino swore he would have him killed when he got out. But I think they both actually died right about the same time. So there was no no revenge. He died of natural causes. And so did Tony Pino. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was kind of sad because he he never really um, he was a bright man. He was a very bright man, but he never really um, was able to find something that he was good at except for thieving. And Mm -hmm. he was pretty good at that. Um, so um, he kind of ended up a, a lonely person. Uh, Stephanie, your book, Crime of the Century, uh, uh, is it getting any attention in Hollywood? Uh, yes, it has. I've been approached a number of times about that, and I've been tuned to work with a screenwriter who's very interested in making it into a uh, television miniseries. Uh, and we got close a couple times, but um, haven't quite made it yet. But but um, he assures me that these things just take time and we just yes. can hang in there. <laughs> but um, we, he, he's very excited about it because we're taking – uh, some of the characters and creating, I don't want to spill right, too right. much about I mean, it, but, but, but he, the idea is to really um, take a, re, a story out of it um, for a miniseries, which I think would be really great because one of the issues with the movies is they tried to cram too much into a two hour movie when there's just so many aspects of this case that um, are worth retelling, that are mm. fascinating. Even the story of how the movie was made has its own crime. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, interesting. It's, fascin- it's a fascinating story, and it's definitely out. Where can they get your book? I know you have a website as well. We can. You can get it any any um, Amazon. You can get it from Amazon. You can. My suggestion is to go to your local um, bookstore. I love I love bookstores. So go to your local independent bookstore and ask them to order it. And that would be the. They might not be the cheapest, but it's the best mm. way to get. No, it. it's a fantastic read, and uh, it's called "Crime of the Century: How the Brinks Robbers Stole Millions in the Hearts of Boston." It's a, uh, it's a five star rated all over Amazon. And uh, <laughs> stuff. I, I want to. I thank you for your time. And uh, this is. Oh, been, thank you so much. I want to thank you for doing this because I'm a big. I, I've always been fascinated by. It. Every time I drive by it, I say, I always tell my kids, you know, what, what would happen over there, and it's a fascinating story. 
It, re- it really is. And so I really appreciate your interest in this. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much, Stephanie. I will talk to you okay. down the road and uh, take care of yourself. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much. All right, take, care. take care. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 All right, all right. There you have it. Uh, again, thank you to Stephanie Shoro for coming on the show. Check out her book and all her of her books. Uh, she also has a great website, stephanieshowroad.com. Check it out. The book is called Crime of the Century, How the Brinks Robbers Stole Millions in the Hearts of Boston. Uh, check it out. Fascinating read. So many new de- de- details. And um, check it out. Seventh, again, 70th anniversary. Um Another great show by produced by my wonderful, wonderful producer Justin, young Justin, I like to call him. Uh, he's rocking the keyboards over here, and because uh, <laughs> I sure as hell don't know how to do that kind of stuff. Um, I was born, I, I was raised on rabbit ears, and that was it. That's all we know how to do back in the day. We didn't have remote controls and cable, fresh air. <laughs> just, I've never had to look at a magazine. Let me just let <laughs> me just say that. There you go. I know newspapers. No, I mean, nothing, nothing like that. Imagine 1950 when this, this story broke. The newspapers and oh yeah, extra extra. Read all about it. Brinks robbery. Place must have been going nuts. I mean, the only the only kind of things that come close nowadays are like national scandals or like yeah. like you know national security threats or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. That's the only kind of thing that commands that kind of attention yeah, anymore. So it was amazing for its time and. Uh, Fascinating crime, and a lot of people out there are still fascinated to this day about it. So check out her book, and uh, check out Stephanie Shoro, S-C-H-O-R-O-W.com. Check it out. We'll see you next Saturday. Stick around for my man, Mighty Mighty PR, uh, spinning the disco classics. Give him a call. It's a live show. Get on the air, 781-559-3300. Tell him I told you to call you. Uh, We will see you next Saturday. Yeah, next Saturday. We'll see you next Saturday, 2 o'clock. Check us out. Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid. Bam! He's the Okay, everybody, that's a wrap.